Well, hi and welcome to our talk. Here to stay gaining persistence by abusing advanced authentication mechanisms. I'm Marina. I'm here today with Egal. We're both security researchers at Microsoft at the ATA Group. So today I want to discuss with you some legitimate mechanisms in Active Directory which might get abused by attackers in order to get persistence in the environment. So first of all, they're relatively easy to exploit. They do not require the search for any zero-day exploits. Also, they can be very easily automated. And last and worst of all, those are usually not monitored, which may allow attackers to stay under the radar and gain persistence without being detected for a long time. After presenting some of those, we'll discuss some of the detection methods, what you can do in order to prevent this from happening in your own environment. Also, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you after this talk. So what's our agenda for today? We'll begin with an introduction to some key terms which are important to understand the attack scenarios we're going to show a bit later on. We'll begin with an intro to Kerberos and Kerberos delegation. Then we'll dive in into our main subject of a talk, how attackers can gain persistence in an Active Directory environment. Specifically, we will focus on the stage in which attackers have already gained high privileges, and they're interested in maintaining them for as long as possible without being detected. We'll also introduce a new concept that we call malicious just-in-time administration, which I'll define a bit later on. Also, we're gonna try and go with the live demo and finally show some mitigations and takeaways from our talk. All right, so let's take a few minutes to discuss Kerberos. So Kerberos is a ticket-based authentication protocol Say some domain user wants to access some application server in the domain. How would the authentication process work? First of all, the Kerberos client will issue an AS request to the domain controller, requesting a special ticket to a service called the Kerb TGT. In response, you will get a special ticket called the ticket granting ticket, which is then used in the second stage. So the second stage would be the client sending a TGS request to the ticket granting service, this time requesting a ticket for that specific service that he wanted access to. So he will attach the ticket granting ticket here, along with additional authentication data. And if the authentication is successful, he will get in return that service ticket for that specific service. Third and final stage would be using that ticket to access that application service. So the thing to remember here is the difference between the ticket granting ticket and the service ticket. While the service ticket can only be used to access that specific service, the ticket granting ticket can be used in multiple TGS requests to request more service tickets and access more domain resources. So a ticket granting ticket in a way is more powerful than a regular service ticket and it is sort of the master ticket for every user this is why attackers would usually target those tickets since it can allow them to access more domain resources. All right, let's move on to Kerberos delegation. So first of all, why is delegation needed? So it's needed in scenarios in which an application needs to reuse user credentials. Let's take, for example, a user authenticating to some web server, which then in return needs to access some SQL server and perform some operations on behalf of that user. So the question is, how can the web server access that SQL server on behalf of the user, since the web server is not aware of the user credentials and also we don't want it to be. So for those scenarios, exam exactly is why the delegation mechanism was introduced. It means that the web server will be allowed to delegate Kerberos tickets to the SQL server. Technically, this means that the web server is going to be able to request for service tickets on behalf of other users. So in this case, the web server would request a service ticket to that SQL server on behalf of the authenticating user. Third stage would be just accessing the SQL server using that ticket and performing any operations using the user's privileges. So as you can hear, this is not a trivial functionality since it allows the servers to impersonate other users and use their, uh, use their privileges. So defining it requires additional privileges, which we'll discuss a bit later on. So there are two types of delegations. The first one is the unconstrained delegation, which means that a single server can request tickets to any other service in the domain. 
As you can hear, this is way too much power for a single service, and it's not recommended to use on any account which is not a domain controller. This is exactly why the constraint delegation functionality was introduced. It means that a single service can only perform delegation to a single service or a few services which were defined in advance. So this makes a lot more sense. It means that a service would only be allowed to request for service tickets on behalf of other users only to specific services. This is the scenario that we will focus on today. All right, so let's see how attackers can gain persistence in Active Directory environments. First of all, just a quick look at the attack stages. Attackers get into the network. They do not have any privileges. They do not have any access to any domain resources. And the first stage would be to search for that initial access, which usually, usually comes in the form of credentials. So they send any phishing emails or anything else. And at the end, they would get either a domain account or a local system access to one of the domain computers. Second stage would be moving from that domain account, regular domain user, to a domain admin. So this is the lateral movement phase. They perform a lot of recon. They move from one machine to the next, each time dumping more credentials, using them to connect to more machines, until they finally reach the credentials of the domain admin. So usually, this stage does not take more than 48 hours. And unfortunately, in a lot of times, it takes even a lot less since admin credentials, as you know, are not as well secured as they should be. Also, monitoring systems many times focus on this stage to catch attackers, so the attackers might get busted some here along the way. However, if all detections fail, it's very important to be aware of that last and final stage, which is a last chance to get the attackers in our environment. So the third and final stage would be getting from that domain admin account to full persistence of the environment. First of all, why is a domain admin account not enough to already gain persistence? Well, what happens if that domain admin account is discovered and its password is reset? So attackers are going to lose their high privileges, and they're going to start this entire process all over again. This is why attackers would like, the moment they have the domain admin credentials, to make sure that they would remain and have those high privileges for as long as possible without being detected. And this is exactly the stage that we will focus on, what attackers might do once they already have that domain administrator to ensure that even if they lose a hold of that account, they would be able to elevate their privileges at any stage. All right, so let's discuss what attackers might do to get from a domain admin to full persistence in the Active Directory environment. Before moving on to the methods we want to talk to today, let's just mention shortly a few of the common methods that attackers may use today. One of the most common methods is to, of course, dump the NTDSD file from the Active Directory, which contains all domain secrets, all user hashes they can later on use to access any domain resource. Also, they can use the golden ticket attack, in which they forge a ticket granting ticket for an administrative account, and later on use it to request more service tickets and access more domain resources. Also, there is the skeleton key or any other backdoor which can be left on the domain controller. So each of those has its own weaknesses. For example, replication requests using the DRS UAPI from a non-domain controller machine can be detected by analyzing network traffic. Also, there are some ways to detect crafted tickets. And any backdoor that is left on the domain controller has, own, has its own signature. For example, the skeleton key can be detected by an encryption downgrade activity from the domain controller. So those are just some of the methods that attackers use today to gain persistence. And today, we want to discuss a few different methods, which all rely on the new concept that we want to introduce to you today, which is called the malicious just-in-time administration. So before discussing about the malicious concept, let's mention what the just-in-time administration concept means. So it's not recommended to have users that have permanent high privilege in the environment, since obviously those serve as very valuable targets for attackers. Attackers would target those users that have permanent high privileges and would enable them to get access to any domain resource. For this reason, exa exactly the JIT administration concept was introduced. It means that users will not have permanent high privileges in the environment. 
However, at any stage, if a user requires high privileges to perform an operation, he would request those privileges. If he's authorized to get them, he would get them but just for a limited amount of time, usually just a few hours. And when the time period expires, the high privileges would be revoked. So if the user would need those high privileges again, he would need to go through this entire process once again. So as you can see, this reduces the attack surface since it makes the life of the attackers a bit harder. It's going to be harder to find a user that is, has the privileges of that domain admin. So while this concept was introduced to protect the environment from the attackers, a very similar concept can be abused by attackers in order to evade most of the detection, most of the detection mechanisms that are, in, that are in place today. This is exactly what brings us to the malicious just-in-time concept. So what this concept means is that attackers might have limited access in the environment. However, at any stage, they would be able to perform a few, a few short steps in order to regain those high privileges, perform any malicious operations, and then immediately erase their footprints, delete all traces from the environment that they ever had those privileges, in order to, to, to avoid all the detections that might be in place in the system. So we're going to talk about what attackers might do when they have the domain admin account. In order to ensure themselves, they would be able to perform a malicious JIR operation at any time and regain those high privileges, possibly without being detected. So we'll show three scenarios to illustrate this concept. The first is the delegation scenario, and then we'll discuss two concepts involving the admin as the holder object. So at this stage, Eagle will discuss the first delegation scenario, and I'll come back in a bit later. All right. All right, thank you, Marlena. How is everybody doing so far? All right. So, we're now going to explore several malicious JIT attack scenarios, but uh, those scenarios are just the tip of the iceberg of what can be done by abusing the JIT concept. I like to emphasize that a malicious JIT is just a concept which can be implemented in many different ways. So, I hope the following examples will give you some ideas as a base that you can expand and develop on later on. So let's begin this section by reviewing two key concepts which relates to object security. So almost everything in Active Directory is an object and those objects need to be protected from unauthorized access. So there are several different security mechanisms which protects those uh, Active Directory objects and one of the main ones is called the access control list. So an access control list is a list of access control entries or ACEs and each ACEs in access control identifies security principle and specifies the access right allowed denied for that account. So basically, uh, access control is, is a list of permission for specific uh, users on uh, that object. So in addition to an access list, we have something called an object ownership or an object owner. The owner of an object can modify permissions and give other users the right to take ownership or have full control over that object. So, short example would be if user receive a new laptop from the helpdesk team and he joined that laptop to the Active Directory, what happened behind the scene is that a new computer account object will be created and the owner of that computer account will be the user because this user was the first one created that object, the first one touched that object. In some other cases, when IT staff create an object in Active Directory, by default, the administrator group will be the owner of those objects. So what is so special about object ownership? Well, uh, an owner of an object has a special permission which uh, allow him to uh, regain himself full read and write uh, permission to that object. So basically, if you are an owner, owner of an object, you can always regain yourself full permissions. Also, you can gain this permission to other uh, user accounts. So now that, now that we have explored those three concepts, we can move uh, to our first attack scenario. So before diving in, I, I would like to mention that each attack scenario we show you today is divided into two main parts. The first uh, part will explain what steps need to be followed uh, in order to remain persistent in the environment. 
during the time that attacker have uh, full uh, domain privileges. And the second stage uh, explain what steps need to be followed in order to regain those privileges after losing uh, the access to the, the environment. So let's get going by showing how attackers can adopt the malicious JIT concept and abuse the Kerberos delegation mechanism. All right. So the first step uh, attackers need to follow will be adding a new computer account. And you're probably asking yourself, so why do we need to create a new computer account? We can use just an existing computer account. But actually, uh, we prefer to create a new computer account because uh, we're only creating an Active Directory object. So there is no physical computer behind it. And in that way, the encryption key of that computer account will be generated once, and attackers can then save this encryption key. And this is important because we're going to use this computer account to authenticate against the domain controller later on. In addition to that, uh, attackers need to change the owner of that computer account to some, um, uh, to some account that they hold on to. In our example, we're going to use a malicious user. It's just a regular domain user which we created. So as you see on the screen, uh, we created a new computer account which is called the client one. And the owner of that computer account is uh, the malicious user. So just to sum up, we added a new computer account and changed its owner to the user account in the attacker possession. Uh, later on, also, the attackers need to save the encryption key of that computer account. And we also changed the owner of that computer account so attackers can regain themselves full privileges to that uh, computer account object. So although the attackers can regain full write and read permission to that object, there are few special attributes and properties which, uh, allow, uh, which require additional permissions an additional user right. And because we are showing you today the delegation scenario, uh, uh, this malicious user will need to have a special uh, user right. So the next step will be going to the domain controller group policy and searching for a special user right which is called enable computer and user accounts to be trusted for delegation. So we register our, register our malicious user to possess this uh, special user, right? We're showing you it in the GUI, but it can be done easily using PowerShell or some other scripting language. And now the attackers will be able to edit any delegation properties and attributes on that computer account object. All right, that's all the steps attackers need to prepare in advance in order to be ready for the malicious JIT operation. So now we're gonna discuss the second stage in which we will explain what steps need to be followed in order to regain those privileges. All right. So right now we have a computer account and the owner of that computer account is the previously created uh, the malicious user account. And, but actually we don't have any effective uh, read on our, we have read uh, permission, but we don't have any write permission on that object. So the first step will be regaining, regaining ourselves full permission to that object. After that, we can edit any property of that object. So we're just showing you that we edit this malicious user into the access list of that computer account object. All right, next step will be uh, searching a special uh, attribute, which is called the MSDS allow to delegate to. This attribute is basically a list of service principal names to which this specific computer account is allowed to delegate to. Meaning, to which services this computer account is allowed to request service tickets on behalf of other users. So we're gonna use this computer account uh, like a service, and uh, this computer account will, will impersonate some users, so it will uh, request tickets on behalf of domain users. So you can see that we added a special service principle name, which is called the CareTGT. So uh, as Marina mentioned in the intro section, uh, before user can request specific uh, service tickets, they first need to grant themselves the ticket granting ticket. And the way to do that will be approaching the uh, uh, Kerb TGT service. This is basically a service which represents the KDC, the Kerberos mechanism. So if authentication is successful, uh, the user will receive a valid ticket granting ticket. With, uh, and with this ticket, he can request additional service tickets. So we added this Kerb TGT service to the list, and now we can use this computer account to uh, be act on behalf of other users and request uh, uh, approach this CareTGT service. 
So we're gonna impersonate the administrator account. So we're gonna uh, request a ticket granting ticket on behalf of the administrator account. And if everything goes well, uh, the domain controller will return a valid ticket granting ticket. So meaning now attackers have full uh, access to any resources in the domain environment for the next 10 hours. And this ticket also can be renewed by default for the next seven days. So with a few steps, attackers are able to regain themselves full access to the domain environment. So last step uh, to complete our malicious JIT content, the last step will be removing footprint and removing traces. So we need to remove the KFT GT a service principal name from this attribute and remove our malicious user from the access list of that computer account object. So the only thing left will be this computer account, the new computer account we created, and the owner of that computer account, which belongs to, to malicious user. So now we're going to show you a short demo of this attack. All right, so don't worry if you haven't been able to follow all the technicalities. We'll, sh we'll show a live demo which would hopefully be a bit more clear and show every single step that Eagle just explained. All right, so as we said, we have just make a duplicate. We have two steps in a malicious JIT scenario. First of all, what attackers might do once they have the domain admin account in order to ensure that they can regain high privileges and at a later stage and what happens once they lost, lost those admin privileges and they want to regain them. So the first stage, attackers gain that domain admin. What do they need to do in order to prepare the environment for, for a malicious JIT operation? So first of all, Eagle created here a new computer account called Client1. And as you can see, the malicious user is not part of the ACL of this computer. However, if we examine more carefully, we can see that our malicious user is the owner of this object. So all we have now is just a simple computer account with an, a user as its owner. And this computer, of course, is not allowed to perform the legation. So we just have a normal computer account. Nothing suspicious about this. Any user can usually add up to 10 domain computers to the domain. Second thing would be adding that malicious user who is not a domain admin, just a regular domain account that is under the control of the attackers and grant him the special permission to edit the delegation attributes of Active Directory objects. So here we added our malicious user and by default only the administrators should be present in that group policy. So what happens next is that the attackers have lost their domain admin privileges and they want to regain them by performing a malicious JIT operation. So now we're connected from a remote machine in hold of the attackers as the malicious user, just a regular domain user without administrative privileges. As you can see, he cannot access the C drive on the domain controller, no, spe no special privileges there. So we have a few tickets here in memory. All the tickets are for that malicious user. We're gonna go ahead and delete all those tickets from the memory. All right, so we're gonna clear the tickets cache. Great, so now we do not have any tickets and what we're gonna do is we have prepared a script in advance which performs our malicious operation. Let's go ahead and run our script real quick and see how it affected the domain controller environment. So let's get back to the domain controller and let's see what happened as a result of the script. So first of all, we added the malicious user to the ACL of that computer, now granting, granting him full control of that object. Second thing and most important is that now this computer is enabled to perform delegation. You can see in the UI that you do not see any services to which this computer is allowed to perform delegation to. However, if we look at the attribute editor, we can see that this computer is allowed to perform delegation to the CareTGT account meaning we have now a computer account that is able to obtain ticket granting tickets on behalf of other users. So of course, the last stage would be simply getting a ticket granting ticket for an administrative account using this privilege. So in order to do this, we use the open source tool uh, MIT Kerberos. We didn't use any Windows APIs. And as a result, we can see that we got the ticket of an administrator. All right, let's take a look at the files that we have in our 
in our directory. As we can see, we have a ccache file that was created right now as a result from us running the script. So this file contains all the tickets we got in, as a result from running our command. What we're going to do in the next stage is load those tickets from the ccache file to our current session's memory. Okay, so we use the MIT Keros for that as well. And let's so take a look at the tickets we have in memory now. So as you can see, now we have a ticket to the KRPTDT for the administrative account. Let's see whether we can access the C drive now. And we were successful. Now we were able to access the... <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, live demos are hard, but... So we were able to access the C drive as that computer, using that computer account. So by a simple thing as using that computer account along with that special user right, we were able to get an administrative ticket. All we need is to just get the ticket and immediately, immediately we can remove all traces for, from the environment that we ever performed this operation, meaning we will immediately disable this computer from performing delegation and removing the user from the ACL of that computer object. So we saw how you can, so just one example of how you can perform a malicious jet operation, get a ticket granting ticket, immediately remove the footprints, and then you can use this ticket along with renewals for up to a week. So this was our first example. Now Eagle will discuss the second attack scenario. Thanks, Marlon. So technical problems are common here, as we understand. Just a sec. All right, we're going to try that again. All right. So, having a look at the uh, attack delegation scenario, we can now move on and speak ab um, about our uh, admin as the holder manipulation. So, recently there were a lot of online buzz about how uh, attackers can abuse access lists, Active Directory access lists, and how those access lists can be used in order to elevate privileges uh, or remain persistent in the environment. So, uh, to illustrate how access list elevation or privilege work, let's look at the built-in domain administrator group. If a compromised account has right permission on this group object, attackers will be able to add new members as needed and gain full domain uh, access. But actually, all the built-in groups are protected by a special mechanism, which is called the admin as the holder mechanism. So what happened behind the scenes is that we have a special process, which is called the SD Pro process, and this process runs every hour on all the protected groups and their members recursively and inspect the access list of those group. If uh, for some reason there is a new entries on those access lists, uh, the SDPro process basically compare those access lists against the access list which is defined on the admin as the holder object. So an admin as the holder object is just a regular Active Directory object with, with, with its, its, its own access list. And this access list act like a template. So every time as the process runs, he inspects the access list of the protected groups and compares those access lists against the access list of the admin as the holder. If there are any uh, new changes to those access lists, he will copy the access list from the admin as the holder object uh, and replace the access list defined on the protected group. So uh, Actually, as, as you can see, it's, it's, not so, it's not so simple to uh, edit or add new entries to access list uh, of protected groups. Uh, there, there are also, uh, sorry about that, I'm a bit nervous today. So uh, 
there are also a known technique which uh, explain how uh, attackers what how attackers can use the admin as the holder object uh, in order to uh, remain persistent in the environment. So instead of editing uh, the protected group access list, uh, what attackers can do they can go and, and change the access list of the admin as the holder object, and in that way, after one hour when the SD process runs. Uh, he will copy the uh, new entry of that access list to all, to all protected groups, meaning attackers will have, again, uh, full access to any resources. But this technique considered to be a bit noisy uh, because it propagates to all the built-in groups. So today we're going to show you a bit different technique which does not involve any editing of the uh, admin as the holder object. Instead, what we're going to do is uh, just exclude one of the built-in groups. There are four built-in groups which can be excluded from the SD probe mechanisms. Uh, you see those on the screen. One of those is the backup operator group, which, which is also considered to be a highly sensitive group. So in order to perform this operation, attackers need to search for a special attribute, which is called the DS heuristic attribute, and uh, ex exclude this uh, group. So we excluded this group from the SD prop inspection, and now when the SD process will run, he will bypass this specific group. So now attackers can go ahead and add a new entry to the, to the access list of, of this uh, built-in group, but they adding the only one entry only to this specific group without uh, affecting any other built-in groups. So it's a more stealthy technique. So after adding uh, a malicious user to the access list of that group, attackers can add themselves as a member of that group. And the backup operator group provides special uh, permissions to its members, which allow them to backup any domain machine, including the domain controllers. So attackers can authenticate against the domain controller, dump the local hard drive, which also include the ntds.dit file, which is the Active Directory database, and extract from them uh, all the necessary uh, user accounts. So performing, by performing a, a few steps, attacker can easily regain himself again full uh, access to the domain environment. So the last step will be, of course, removing this uh, uh, malicious user from being member of the backup operator group, and, and th 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 that will complete the malicious JIT concept. So now Marina will present you the last attack scenario. All right. So the third and final scenario also deals with the manipulation of the admin as the holder in order to gain persistence. So in this step, all the attackers might do when they have that domain admin account is simply change the owner of the admin as the holder object. So here we're changing the owner of our malicious to our malicious user that we used before, just a regular domain user, not a domain admin. So what brought us into looking into this owner attribute? So one of the oldest steps that attackers used to gain persistence in an environment was simply by adding a new dom domain admin account to the environment. However, since high-privileged group membership started to be monitored, it's not that easy to get away with the new domain admin. This is why now there was a lot of talk about how attackers can gain persistence by abusing ACLs. Also, Will and Andy gave a great talk about that at Black Hat and DEF CON. Um, so if, for example, you have an ACL granting you full control of the domain admins group, you can get to a domain admin account in a single step by simply adding a new domain member, domain admin member. However, as a result, we have now a, new, a bunch of new tools emerging that are scanning the environment and attempting to find any ACLs misconfigurations that might be abused by attackers. This is why we took another step back and we're looking at the owner of the object, which is not part of the ACL. So for example, if you have ownership over the domain admins group, you can get to a domain admin privileges in two steps. First of all, you can grant yourself an access control entry, giving you full control of that, app, that object. And second stage, simply just add a new domain admin. So between those three attack techniques, the owner attribute is the least monitored one. And hopefully after this talk, this will change. So back to our example, we just changed the owner of the admin as the holder object. Next step, attackers lost their administrative privileges. Let's see how they can abuse the previous stage in order to perform a malicious JIT operation. So what they can do is that just before the SD prop process runs, they would add a malicious user to the admin as the holder ACL, granting him full control of the admin as the holder object. 
Since he's the owner of the objects, he can edit the ACL as he wants. As Egal explained, what's going to happen when the SDProp process runs is that, that this access control entry is going to be copied to all protected groups and users in the domain. So now our malicious users, user has full control of the domain environment. Specifically, he has full control of the domain admins group. So obviously, from this stage, it's pretty easy to get to domain admin privileges. He would simply add a new domain admin to an environment and get an administrative ticket granting ticket. So in order to not raise any flags and complete entirely the malicious data operation, he would of course need to delete all traces from the environment, immediately remove the traces, so they would remove the malicious user from the ACL of the admin as the holder. And in order to not keep that access control entry on all protected groups and users until the next time the SDProp process runs, which should be in another hour, they can just force the SDProp process to run, which would immediately remove that malicious access control entry from all the protected groups and users. So last step would be removing the malicious users from the dom domain admins group. So as you can see, the access control entry and the group membership was present in the environment for just a few seconds, which was enough for attackers to get a ticket grant and ticket and potentially avoid any de detection mechanisms which are scanning the environment. So we showed an example about how the owner of the admin as the holder object can be abused to gain persistence, but of course, a similar manner, in a similar manner, you can use this to gain persistence by editing the owner of any protected group in the environment. All right, so now that we've discussed the attack techniques, let's discuss some of the mitigations. If you're a defender, let's see what you can do in order to protect yourself from such attack scenarios. So first of all, we want to detect any delegation misconfiguration. Of course, we need to monitor the group policy that enables account, accounts to edit the delegation attributes of Active Directory objects. Since we saw what this privileges does, we really need to monitor this, and only domain admins or administrators should be able to do this. Also, we need to monitor the accounts that are trusted to perform delegation. Who are the accounts that are allowed to request service tickets on behalf of other users? Also, of course, we need to monitor the allowed to delegate to attribute, which states to which services exactly this account is allowed to perform delegation. No reason for the pair TGT account to be present there whatsoever. Another important thing is that on every Active Directory object, there is a checkbox stating that this account is sensitive and cannot be delegated. What it means is that even if a service is allowed to perform delegation and request service tickets on behalf of other users, it will not be able to request service tickets on behalf of those sensitive users. So we, we recommend to turn this on for any high privileged users in the environment in order to not allow services to use those accounts privileges. Also, we need to monitor the admin as the holder object, of course, the access control list, which is very important and is then copied to all protected users and groups in the domain. Also, the owner of this object, since we saw how attackers can abuse this, and of any other protected group in the domain. Also, monitor the excluded groups from the admin as the holder protection. Monitor they, their NCL as well, why they're excluded and their access control list. Of course, uh, we recommend using uh, any event logging to see whether there was a suspicious change on any Active Directory object. So what we want you to take from this talk, whether you're from the blue team or the red team, is the malicious just-in-time concept. So in which attackers may not have constant high privileges in the environment. However, at any stage, they have the ability to regain their privileges, regain high privileges, perform any malicious operations, and then immediately delete all the traces in order to avoid most of the detection systems that are in place. So we showed a few examples that illustrate this concept, but of course, it can be used and extended in a lot of similar scenarios. So as a defender, it's very important to be aware of any such escalation path. And when you scan the environment to see whether attackers currently hold persistence of the environment, don't just scan the stage in which attackers already have that domain admin account, but also monitor all the stages in between which might allow him to lead to quick privilege escalation at any time. 
All right, so this is all we have time for. Thanks for listening, guys.